What's up everyone, welcome back to another What If video. Okay, I know, the scenario today sounds a bit weird, to say the least. Goku becoming immortal. I mean, on one hand that sounds crazy, and on the other hand, it sounds overpowered. But surprisingly, it's something that I've been suggested a lot. Sure, we know on Namek that Frieza wanted to become immortal, that was why he was searching for the Dragon Balls, same for Vegeta. But today's video is a little more lighthearted in nature, kind of a joke what if. Because maybe, as a protective measure, what if they made Goku immortal instead with a wish? I know it's a what if mini, but we have a lot to cover here. This will remain as a one-parter, but if we can hit 2500 likes, I'll continue it with the second part, which will also be the finale. Today's video will only cover Dragon Ball Z. And without further ado, let's actually get into the story. So, Paronga is summoned on Namek. Of course, the first wish is made like normal, revive Piccolo. He's the first one chosen because it'll bring the Dragon Balls back on Earth. And they could probably bring him here to help fight. But it turns out that Paronga actually isn't going to bring him here, that would require a separate wish. The group thinks carefully. They really need some extra muscle. Well, you know what? Why don't they just wish if Goku was healed? Actually, Krillin has a better idea. Goku might not like this, but they could always reverse it later, right? Well, he hopes they can. Because this isn't something Goku is asking for, and he might not like it. Krillin suggests that they should make Goku immortal. The same thing Vegeta wanted so he could defeat Frieza. Maybe if Goku becomes immortal, first of all it'll heal him, and he can come out and fight, not worrying about dying. Gohan and Dende are a bit concerned about this, but like Krillin says, they could reverse it later if they need. Time is also of the essence, so they don't really have too much time to think it over. Dende goes ahead and makes the wish, asking Paronga to make Goku immortal. Paronga lifts up his hand, giving an okay symbol. The wish has been made. Immediately, in his healing pod, Goku wakes up. Of course, Vegeta notices this though. He's already in hot pursuit to Paronga, and he lands just as soon as the wish is made. He wants to be made immortal, and he demands that Dende ask for it. Nothing can prepare him for what he hears next, about the wish that was just made. And then, two crazy things happen. One, Paronga disappears, and the Dragon Balls become a nerd. Not a good sign. But two, they sense something really powerful nearby. He breaks out immediately, not knowing what just happened. But something feels different. He can't quite put his finger on it, but he heads to the battlefield regardless. All the while, Vegeta faces Frieza like normal, waiting for Kakarot to arrive. And sure enough, he does. Much stronger than before. Awesome, another plaything for Frieza. At this point, Goku's around the same strength that he was once he originally woke up after being beaten by Ginyu, meaning he's about a power level of 3 million, the same as before. Kinda overkill considering Frieza's still in his first form. He's easily fighting Frieza, and Frieza eventually has to step up to his second and third form, going all the way to his final form even. And this is where the match starts heating up. Frieza goes up to 50% power, and Goku's at Kaioken times 20. As we know, Kaioken tears the body apart from the seams. But Goku notices something different. He uses Kaioken and it does hurt him a bit, but instantly after he's hurt, he gets healed. Although he continuously heals from using Kaioken, he's not going to get any power boost from it, because Zenkais don't happen if the Saiyan inflicts it on themselves. But still, the fact that he heals whenever he uses it means he can use it for pretty much as long as he wants, until he runs out of stamina, of course. Something's not right. Krillin feels bad that he didn't say it before, but he didn't want Frieza to kill him. So now he reveals to Goku, Paronga made Goku immortal. This was a countermeasure against Frieza. And if Goku doesn't like it, they could always reverse it. Well, most likely. I mean, if Paronga can grant it, he could remove it, right? Frieza refuses to believe this, and while Goku's distracted, he shoots him through the chest. And everyone looks in shock as Goku falls to the ground. Frieza laughs. It seems the immortality wasn't real. But then on the ground, Goku slowly gets back up, his chest closing, fully healed, and actually a bit stronger. Immortality combined with Zenkai's, that is a terrifying combo, and it's going to be a recurring theme throughout this what if, which is why it's kind of a joke one. Goku gets back up, stronger than before, activating Kaioken, ready to fight Frieza. This immortality thing might be weird to get used to, and if he decides later he will get rid of it, but for this fight, it does seem kind of fun. Albeit a bit unfair, but he gets why Krillin did it, he wanted to ensure that they would win. He'll worry about undoing it later. Right now, he has to fight Frieza. Frieza refuses to believe this, and he even goes 100%, throwing everything he can at Goku. Goku's actually not strong enough to face him, and Frieza keeps on injuring him over and over. This isn't fun for Goku, he's not intentionally getting hurt, and even if he is immortal, he still feels pain. But every time Frieza hurts him, mortally wounding him, Goku heals and gets a little bit stronger, sometimes way stronger. Vegeta watches in amazement. With immortality, he can exploit Saiyan power boosts. And unintentionally he's doing that. Every time Frieza hurts him, he comes back stronger. Fully healed. No matter what Frieza does, he can't kill Goku. And now, in Kaioken times 20, Goku's actually enough to match up against full power Frieza. 
and if Frieza tries to destroy the planet, Goku can just block it, no problem. Not only is he strong enough to do so, but he doesn't have to worry about injury either. Frieza even tries going for Goku's friends, mainly Krillin, but Krillin gets to live here. Goku grabs Frieza's hand and stops him before he can do anything. He gives Frieza plenty of opportunities to give up, but Frieza just keeps trying. Ultimately, Goku's left with no choice but to defeat him. And he does so. Cool, they could all head back to Earth now. Oh yeah, one last loose end to tie up. Now that Piccolo's on Earth, they've already gathered all the Dragon Balls. And anyone who's died due to Frieza's army is revived. The Namekians thank everyone for their help. And it turns out, Purunga is brought back too. Only briefly though. So they have a third wish. Is his immortality undone? Personally, I think it's something that he would do. But since this what-if is all about him becoming immortal, we're gonna keep it for now. Let's say Goku wants to test drive it a bit more. This is kind of a joke what if after all, it would be a shame to just end off here. And with his immortality, that means some interesting things ahead. For one, I see some timeline alterations. No trunks here, because let's assume future Goku does the same exact thing. There's not even any timeline separation. Over the next few years, life goes normally. In all honesty, I feel like Chi Chi wouldn't be too happy about the immortality thing, but Goku suggests that she can get it too, and they could live immortally forever. Hey, even immortality for the whole family. They could happily live as long as they want. Nah, that's a little too much. They'll just have to get Goku to reverse it later. But it's a good thing that he's immortal because eventually he comes down with the heart virus. This is the end for him, right? Not good. Well, if he's immortal, that's not going to exclude sicknesses. It might be a little agonizing for a bit, but I feel like Goku would be able to get over this. No matter what method of death he's facing, Goku can't die. And if it's the heart virus that's going to kill him, his body will just naturally heal from it. That's a lot of headaches solved. Especially because not long after, the androids arrive. No 19 and 20 this time, 17 and 18, going around destroying stuff like they're good at. Naturally, the dragon team would get wind of this. I mean, cities don't just randomly blow themselves up, right? Something's definitely going on and it doesn't seem good. So, Goku and friends all head into the city. The androids are actually pretty pleased. Goku's right there, they don't need to go searching for him. Perfect, he's their target. Immediately, the twins go for Goku. He assumes a fighting stance and gets ready to fight them off. The dragon team's worried. Can he really take them on alone? Nope, he can't. He goes into Kaioken, even pushing up to Kaioken times 50, something he's learned from his training. That's basically the same multiplier as Super Saiyan. But regardless, it's still not enough. Combined, the androids are too strong for him, and they kill Goku. They're pretty happy, but then they look at the dragon team and they don't seem too phased. Do they really not care that Goku just died? Come on, shed a tear or something. Krillin steps in and said they shouldn't laugh just yet, and tells them to look back over to the spot where they killed Goku. He was completely obliterated, and they look over and see. Slowly but surely, from all the scattered pieces of him, Goku coalesces back into himself, and the androids just look in disgust and amazement. Uh, when did Goku learn to do that? What even was that? Goku jumps back into the fight, and the androids go at him again. Too bad for them though, because by killing Goku, they just made him stronger again. Without effort, he goes back into Kaioken times 50, saying he wants to start that fight again. But this time he's advantage over the two androids. And, alone, he defeats them. Once again, another crisis averted. And if we're assuming there's no trunks here, there's probably not the timeline that Cell came from either. Present Cell would still be alive though, but it's going to be a really long time until he's even born. So they don't need to worry about him for now. So it seems pretty clear cut. Goku's just going to defeat every enemy, right? No peril exists anymore. Well, it wouldn't be that simple. Like I mentioned before, immortality might not be something that Goku's too okay with. Same for everyone else. For one, as for Goku, he might feel like it's not a really good way to win fights. It feels like it's cheating in a way. This doesn't give him any challenge, no way to actually motivate himself to go farther. He could just go into a fight, die, and then come back stronger. There's no real fun in that for him. You know how he is as a Saiyan. After going through it once again, he realizes it's not that fulfilling, even though it's a safe option. Another change, of course, no one has Super Saiyan. They don't even know it exists. As far as they're concerned, Vegeta turned into a Super Saiyan on Namek, and so did Goku judging by Vegeta's definition of a Super Saiyan at least. And speaking of Vegeta, or everyone else for that matter, they're left behind. And this doesn't sit right with Vegeta. Why does Kakarot get to be immortal but he doesn't? This is what he wanted all along. And Kakarot just comes in and steals it from right underneath him. Vegeta's been thinking about this for a while, but it's starting to kick in even more, now that he sees how far ahead Kakarot actually is. He's just getting stuff handed to him, and Vegeta doesn't realize that Kakarot doesn't feel fulfilled. He thinks that Kakarot's actually enjoying this, and he begins thinking for himself. Maybe he wants to become immortal too. So while Goku's now realizing that he wants to become unimmortal, Vegeta actually wants to do the opposite and become immortal. Oh Vegeta, you two should really communicate. So over the seven years, a lot of things happen like normal. Trunks was already born and Goten gets born as well. Goku's on Earth after all and he gets to enjoy his family life. 
but I feel like over this time, Goku will actually go ahead and make the wish to undo the immortality. He's now seeing. It's not really too fair to win fights. Sure, it was okay against Frieza, and he wanted to see how it would do when he's trying to protect Earth against some threat, but now he feels he's too strong, and there's no thrill in the fights. He should have really done this before. Plus, by not being immortal anymore, it'll motivate him to train harder, because that'll be the only way he won't die. And again, the whole family thing would be weird. He doesn't want to be alive after his whole family dies. Same with all his friends. Being immortal would just be kind of sad. But as for Vegeta, he doesn't care. He begins plotting something. The seven years go by pretty peacefully. People do keep training, but it's not like anyone's getting Super Saiyan 2 or anything. They still don't know about Super Saiyan. And as I mentioned before, they're not aiming for any form because they already think they're Super Saiyan. And eventually, this time skip ends and we get to the tournament. So a lot of the tournament happens like normal. Same contestants except Android 18 isn't there. Because, you know, she's dead. And a lot of the tournament goes pretty much like normally. The only big difference is that Gohan doesn't go Super Saiyan 2 against Kibito, but he lets out his full power, and Spopovich still drains him. And Spopovich doesn't collect that much power. He doesn't realize it, but there's not nearly enough to revive Boo. Everyone is weaker, especially without Super Saiyan. But even in base, no one's nearly as strong as they were. Goku's close, but still not really there. And it's not like he can spam Kaioken anymore. He still can use it, but it's very stressful, as it once was. The group chases Spokovich and Yamu, and they arrive at Bobby's ship. And once again, a lot of this goes normal. Deborah kills Kibito, and then everyone heads into the ship for their fights. The fight against Pui Pui is still pretty easy, but next up is Yakon. Goku can't defeat him in the same way as he did before, but with pure strength, he'll be fine. He realizes he can't use Key Blast, which is fine. Too bad he can't just overload Yakon with light like he did before. But Yakon is defeated, and then we get to Deborah, the true threat. The only person who could even stand close to Deborah is Goku. And even in Kaioken times 50, which is very stressful for him to use, he can't do much damage to Deborah. But Deborah makes it a point not to kill them. He wants to drag this fight on as long as possible, because it turns out, Bobbidi doesn't have a lot of energy, only about 25%. As Deborah fights Goku, though, he gets an idea. This fight is going to take far too long. Maybe if you get another servant, though, this could help. Someone that's more even to Goku, someone that'll also give off their own energy, and he senses a lot of malice around specifically in one of the people there named Vegeta. Sure, even though Goku was around, Vegeta's not going to be so happy-go-lucky. He's still a little sour about how I had Goku got. Immortality is basically a cheat. Goku continues his fight with Deborah, with Shin even stepping in. But suddenly, Vegeta starts screaming out in pain. He's being possessed by Bobbidi. Bobbidi can manipulate him pretty easily, promising more power than he could ever desire, and Bobbidi finds out one of his secrets. He's going to make a really effective minion. Similar to normal, Majin Vegeta is born although he's in base form, gaining a strength boost that makes him confident enough to face off against Kakarot. Everyone looks in disbelief, with Deborah actually looking and being happy. Huh, a new co-worker. Really unexpected. Just for fun, Bobbidi teleports everyone over to the World Tournament, leaving Deborah behind. Things continue like normal up until when Goku actually fights Vegeta. Goku's surprised. Vegeta actually got a lot stronger over the seven years. Plus, this Majin thing gives him a boost in power. The two are clashing evenly, but Vegeta's not satisfied. He knows that Kakarot's holding back. He tells Goku to stop playing around. Use that Kaioken thing. Holding back, he activates Kaioken. Only in about times 10 or 20. But somehow, Vegeta's still able to keep up. He scoffs. It seems he's actually surpassed Kakarot now, hasn't he? Goku then begins talking to Vegeta. Why would he do this? And Vegeta explains it all. He wanted to get stronger. He wanted to surpass Kakarot. He couldn't just sit there and let Kakarot get ahead. Especially with the way he did it. Becoming immortal. But he lets Goku in on a little secret. This whole time, over the seven years, he's been trying to catch up to Goku. Hardcore training, trying to learn new techniques, anything. But Vegeta simply couldn't just get ahead. But secretly over this time, without telling anybody, Vegeta decided to even the playing field. He points to himself. No matter what happens, Kakarot will never beat him, because he is now immortal. Goku's just confused. Why would he do this? Goku got rid of his immortality because there was no challenge. He knows that there was a problem with it. He understands where Vegeta's coming from, but isn't this a bit hypocritical? Vegeta's obviously not thinking clearly right now, and hasn't been thinking that clearly over the past few years. His judgment's been clouded. And really, he sees this as fair, a way to even the playing field. He didn't wish for immortality so he could be safe or protect his family or whatever. He was still bent on surpassing Kakarot. Sure, he couldn't exploit Zenkai's with his own training, but now, no matter what fight he's in, he's gonna get stronger. Plus, this Majin thing gives him a huge boost. Goku doesn't get it. Why would Vegeta willingly want to be controlled? That's not like him. Vegeta doesn't care. He wants anything to get ahead. And it seems he's finally done it. Even when he's fighting Kakarot and Kaioken, Vegeta still remains ahead. But what he doesn't know is Goku's been holding back. And although Vegeta feels like he has the advantage, he doesn't. 
Sure, he's immortal, but there's one thing he isn't immune to. During the fight, very quickly, Goku flares into his maximum level of Kaioken, times 100. And with a powerful chop to the neck, he knocks Vegeta out. Vegeta can't be reasoned with consciously, and there's no way he's going to try to kill Vegeta, not like he even can. He just has to immobilize him somehow. Things are looking grim. Goku leaves Vegeta here for the time being, and goes back to Shin and everyone else, trying to fight Deborah. Babidi still doesn't have enough energy, he's only around 50% right now. And they need to stop Deborah before things get bad. Goku, Gohan, and Shin all fight, needing to free Piccolo and Krillin, and also needing to stop Deborah for good. But they just can't do anything. And Shin even wonders if he could escape, but he knows Babidi won't allow that. They can't even reach Babidi right now. All seems lost. Deborah is just going to keep fighting them and fighting them until they get enough energy to revive Boo, and there's nothing they could do about it. But back in the wasteland where they fought, Vegeta wakes up. Kakarot's gone, he just left him there. And this gives Vegeta some time to self-reflect. Kakarot's actually right. Becoming immortal, that was a bit hypocritical. And look where it got him. Nowhere. He's always wanted to become immortal, but he didn't realize until now. There's more to fighting than just winning all the time, and you can't always win by just being immortal. And even by becoming Babidi's slave. He still wasn't strong enough to beat Kakarot. Kakarot simply hit him in the neck and knocked him out. He was holding back, as if Vegeta wasn't an issue at all. Conflicted, Vegeta begins realizing the error of his ways, and it seems he's breaking free of Babidi's spell, little by little. Back at the fight against Deborah, all seems lost. But a new fighter arrives, Majin Vegeta. Instantly, he goes in and tackles Deborah. Everyone's confused, but Vegeta tries something. It might not accomplish much, but there's no risk involved. He holds on to Deborah, starting to glow. Vegeta blows himself up, much to everyone's surprise. They think he's dead, but Goku tells them what happened. Vegeta's immortal now, and surely enough, he regenerates. Deborah is a bit injured, but nothing too bad. How did Vegeta survive that attack? This one's a pest. Deborah doesn't need to keep him around. He asks Babidi permission to kill him, and he grants it. Deborah launches an attack, disintegrating Vegeta, but he regenerates. Perfect. This time, it gave him a Zenkai, because someone else did the damage to him. Deborah's just confused. He keeps trying to attack, but it does nothing. Then Babidi remembers, and he warns Deborah. Vegeta's immortal. Deborah doesn't even have time to react to that, because next, he's once again grabbed by Vegeta, this time creating a larger explosion, killing Deborah. Vegeta regenerates once again, happy to have accomplished this. He never thought he'd say this, but he apologizes to Kakarot. He's seen the error of his ways, and he thanks Kakarot for the little talk. But now, more important things are at hand. They need to find Babidi, and it's not too hard. He doesn't have any defenses, and he's in the ship. Using brute force, they're able to just break into it, blowing it up from the outside. Even if they can't get in, destroying it does the job. Babidi dies, and Boo is never revived. Crisis averted, but there's still an issue. Vegeta has the M on his forehead still. It turns out the curse wasn't reversed. Or was it actually reversed, and that just serves as a permanent reminder of what Vegeta did? Shin and Kabito thank everyone, taking Boo's egg heading back off to their planet. The damage is restored. But there's still the issue of Vegeta. He's immortal, and he still has that mark on his head. Hopefully it means nothing. And it seems he's come to his senses by now. Once again, Earth returns to peace. With no real need or desire to get rid of his immortality, Vegeta decides to keep it. He's content with it for now, and maybe if he decides to get rid of it later, he will. With nowhere really higher to train, Goku and Vegeta decide to contact Shin and Kabito once more, not to become Kais, but because these two are the strongest possible teachers for them. King Kai was pretty good for Goku, so they could only imagine what the guys above him would be like. Shin and Kabito are a little bit hesitant to take them as students, but they end up doing it. It could be good to have some more strong mortals that can defend themselves in Earth. So, why not? The two head to the sacred world of Kai's and begin their training. They see some pretty good increases in power, and for the next few years, they train under the Kai's. Everything's seemingly peaceful right now, so they're very focused on this training. But then one day, they get a visitor. Goku doesn't know who this guy is, but Shin, Kibito, and Vegeta are all scared. It's Beerus and Whis. Beerus just woke up from his nap having a dream about a Super Saiyan God. And according to Whis, it turns out the Supreme Kai had a student of his own. Actually, two of them, and they're both Saiyans. This is perfect for Beerus, they're not too far out of reach. So he asked them, what do they know about the Super Saiyan God? And it turns out, they know nothing. Remember, they don't even know Super Saiyan here. So they're just hearing the word Super Saiyan is a shock to them. Are, are they not already Super Saiyans? Beerus decides he wants to test their power, so the two end up fighting him together. Beerus says they could use whatever they want to try and defeat him. There's no way they will. Since they need to go all out here to impress him, Vegeta decides he's going to use the Z-Sword during the battle, which they've been training with. He swings the sword at Beerus, hoping that it'll do some damage. With one finger, Beerus stops it, and the sword snaps in half. 
causing Shin, Kibito, and Vegeta to panic. But then Beerus recognizes that was the Z-Sword he just broke. Ugh, here we go again. He watches as Elder Kai pops out of the sword, still pissed at Beerus for what happened. Beerus retorts saying he deserved it, and if Elder Kai keeps running his mouth, he'll do it again. As Elder Kai and Beerus argue, everyone just watches confused. There's another Kai? Beerus is pretty angered right now. He can't believe they ended up freeing this nuisance. He should just erase Goku and Vegeta on the spot. Not only are they disappointing in terms of power, but now they've angered him. He'll give them one last chance, find out something about the Super Saiyan God, or get erased. Shin tries to think and then remembers. They can ask Zuno. Oh yeah, that's a pretty good idea. Beerus and Whis will gladly go with them, maybe to up the intimidation factor a bit. So, the entire group is teleported there by Shin, and they ask Zuno about the Super Saiyan God. They learn about the ritual, and apparently five Saiyans need to channel their energy into one other Saiyan. So they decide to go to Earth, grabbing Gohan, Trunks, and Goten. They misinterpreted the instructions though, and it turns out they're one Saiyan short. Thankfully, Videl's pregnant, and it may not work, but it's worth a shot. And they decide they're going to channel their energy into Vegeta, at the request of Beerus. He knows by now that Vegeta is immortal, and it actually would be pretty fun to have an immortal rival. Well, as long as the Super Saiyan God thing turns out to be true, otherwise everyone's getting erased. Thankfully, the ritual works, and Beerus is a little impressed by the power, but not too much impressed. Vegeta still isn't incredibly strong, although Beerus can definitely see the potential. His interest in these two Saiyans peak. Following this, there's no Resurrection F. Since Frieza ended up dying on Namek, they never found out who actually killed him. Originally, Frieza survived and he was able to point out where the Earthlings were, also mentioning who actually tried to kill him. But this time, that doesn't happen. King Cold is still around though, ruling parts of the universe. Knowing him, he probably doesn't care too much about Frieza anymore. Whatever, he'll find a new son somewhere else. But this isn't the last we're seeing of King Cold. You'll see some more of him later on. Probably not in a way you expect though. And naturally, the next thing to do here is the Universe 6 tournament. And things are not looking good as they head into it. As for a team, it's a little bit different. Goku, Vegeta, and Piccolo are still on the team. And Beerus doesn't want to risk bringing in Manaka because they need as much power as they can. Sadly, Gohan can't join, but instead, they get Krillin and Tenshinhan to join the team. Krillin has actually continued training way more since he doesn't have Android 18 with him. Without a family to focus on, all he really has is work and training. And Tenshinhan is Tenshinhan, he's going to be training regardless. These two are the strongest humans on Earth for them to actually have on the team. And the next best option behind Piccolo. But as they recruit the team, Elder Kai notes that these humans are very weak in comparison to the Saiyans. He's kind of disappointed. Krillin and Ten are embarrassed, they just got insulted by a god. But really, Elder Kai says it's because he has an idea. Before Goku and Vegeta go in the room of spirit in time to train, he wants to head in with Ten and Krillin. They're not too sure what's going on, they're being led into an isolated room by an old man, which doesn't sound good at all on paper. But Elder Kai has a trick up his sleeve, and since they're in the room of spirit in time, instead of this taking a few days to accomplish, it's only going to take a few minutes. After a few days on the inside, and a few minutes on the outside, the three of them exit the room of spirit in time. And somehow, Krillin and Ten are way stronger than before. Elder Kai says he unlocked their potential, and thankfully, both of them have continued training so much, so they're really strong since they have a lot of latent potential. Individually, I'd say they're still weaker than Goku and Vegeta, but combined, their powers together may be enough to actually match up against one of the Super Saiyan gods. Just barely though. To be fair, Goku and Vegeta aren't nearly as strong here as they were in canon, while Krillin and Ten are somewhere near the same strength, plus now with Ultimate on top of it. And they know once Yamcha hears about this, he's going to want it too. They'll let him in on it later. But will this be enough for the Universe 6 tournament? Let's find out. In terms of power, I feel like their team matches up pretty well against the Universe 6 team. Although, Goku and Vegeta are going to have to rely on Super Saiyan God a lot, since their base isn't nearly strong enough to compete, while Ten and Krillin will be in Ultimate the whole time. Goku's up against Batamo and wins when he goes Super Saiyan God. But against Frost, he still gets knocked out by the poison, as does Piccolo. But Ten goes up against him and notices the poison needles. He does have superior vision after all with three eyes, which means Goku and Piccolo can fight again later. Next up, Ten faces Megeta, and there's no way for him to win. Apparently, according to the Moro arc, he's not good at coming up with insults. So if he can't fight a metal man there, he probably can't here. Luckily, Vegeta's up next, and he can easily do this. He faces off against Kaba next. And too bad for Kaba because he doesn't learn Super Saiyan here. There's no way Vegeta can teach him Super Saiyan God either. He ends up having to use Super Saiyan God to win the fight. And next up, he's against Hit. But clearly, Hit here is too much for Vegeta. Krillin is up next, and he's also not a match for Hit. And once again, Goku goes up. He does have a trick up his sleeve though. In the room of spirit and time, he figured out he can combine Kaioken with Super Saiyan God. And although it makes for a great show of power, it's still not enough to take on Hit. So Goku is defeated as well. 
The final contestant is Piccolo, and once again, Hit defeats him, essentially sweeping most of the Universe 7 team. Shampa is excited to have won, while Beerus is extremely pissed. This is perfect for Shampa. It means he can wish Earth to be in Universe 6. And now, everyone will remain residents of that universe. To be honest, for the people on Earth, this isn't really a huge change. Of course, people would start freaking out when they noticed the solar system randomly disappeared and got replaced by something else. But life would still go normally. The biggest difference here is that Goku and Vegeta aren't training with Beerus anymore. But they do find something that piques their interest. That Saiyan that they met before, Kaba. Why not visit planet Sadala? It would be a fun little trip, and they may be able to find some more strong Saiyans there. After Earth is settled in Universe 6, and they've prepared a way to travel, they decide to head there. We will have the Tournament of Power eventually, but even though a lot of people are weaker here, it's still shaping up to be a great tournament. And hope exists for Universe 6. A lot of hope. First off, Goku and Vegeta are on Sadala. It seems pretty cool there, and Vegeta did promise to meet Kaba after all. They spend their time learning about the planet and hanging out with Kaba, training with him too. It's a pretty fun trip for them. As of now, they still haven't met Kale and Cauliflower. But once they receive news from Zeno that there's going to be a tournament between the universes, they're going to end up meeting those two, because Cobb is going to try to recruit Caulifla, leading to Kale getting introduced as well. So even though Earth has been in Universe 6 for about a year at this point, this is their first time meeting those two female Saiyans. Cool, more training partners. And while it's good that they have more strong partners, right now they're still forming a team. Hit ends up being the leader of the team. And so far, the team consists of Goku, Vegeta, Hit, Gohan, Piccolo, Kaba, Caulifla, Kale, Tenshinhan, and Krillin. But it's not that clear-cut. There is an interesting development. This Piccolo here, he's not the same Piccolo. It's a little bit of an odd story. Originally, Hit was going to go to Namek to try and recruit some Namekians, seeing if he could find a powerful warrior from there. And although a little premature, all the Namekians decided to fuse together into Saunel and Pirina, who are both really strong on their own. This is kind of an issue. Hit already has a full team, and he found out about this after the fact. But he doesn't want these two to not fight. I mean, their whole planet sacrificed themselves and fused into them. But then, Hit gets an insane idea. He tells them he knows of one more Namekian, one who's actually on the team already. And he asks these two, would they be willing to fuse into him, creating the strongest super Namekian? Needless to say, the two are intrigued. If they fuse into each other and then into another Namekian, the power that they have could be insane. As long as it means the universe has a better shot at surviving, they're up for it. Even if that means they have to become one fighter instead of two. Hit takes them to Earth, and they meet Piccolo. Pretty nonchalantly, Hit says he wants those two to fuse into Piccolo. This is a huge bombshell to drop on him. He knew there was a Namek in this universe, but now he guesses there isn't because all these people have fused into two Namekians. And Hit wants all of them to fuse into Piccolo. But Piccolo thinks about it and realizes that it's actually a great idea. He even considers getting Kami to fuse into him, but then eventually goes against it because he realizes if Universe 6 ends up winning, they could use the Dragon Balls on Earth to restore all the Namekians back to where they were before, instead of all being stuck with Piccolo. Turns out it was a bad idea for Piccolo to mention this, because Hit tells him now that he wants Kami to fuse into him too. Oh crap, Piccolo spoke too much. But it shouldn't be too bad. I mean, even though Piccolo will be the last remaining Namekian in this universe, all he'll have to do is go to Namek and throw up a few eggs. And they could bring Namek back to life. Hit does have a pretty imposing presence after all, and under this threat of Hit, Piccolo eventually goes ahead with it. First, Kami is fused into it, and that alone makes him insanely powerful. It's a pretty bittersweet moment too. Right now, he has Nail and Kami in him, but next, Sanel and Pirina fuse into him. Before Piccolo can even get used to having Kami there, he now essentially has an entire race of Namekians. Hit watches in shock. He knew Namekian fusion was potent, but not this potent. And although he's surprised, he's happy and confident. This new Piccolo will be a valuable addition to the team. With so many Namekians fused into him, his power rivals Hit's. Yeah, that strong. I mean, the two Namekians before were powerful on their own, but imagine how strong they'd be if they fused together, then into Piccolo. This will really help out the team. But there's one more team that I do want to cover. Universe 7. Beerus had to put together a pretty ragtag team, but he ended up doing it. I know a lot of you wanted some GT in this one, and this is the perfect opportunity right here. So first off, on Beerus' team, he decides to recruit some of Frieza's army. There are some really strong people there, after all. He does have to threaten some of them, though. But thankfully, he doesn't really have to do that with King Cold. He just mentions that he knows the two people that killed Frieza. And this is a good opportunity for King Cold to fight them. Like I said, King Cold doesn't care about Frieza much, but would like to kill these two anyways, especially because they're Saiyans. So thankfully, this means he gets King Cold on the team, as well as Tagama and Shisami. He even looks around at the Galactic Patrol. Jocko gets recruited on the team. And he asks Jocko, are there any strong prisoners they can use? Well, there's a few, but they may be a little bit unhinged. 
So no, Moro and 7-3 aren't going to be on the team. But they're able to get Saganbo, who's not nearly on the level of Moro or 7-3, but still a decent addition. And similar to Universe 6, a bunch of Universe 7 Namekians fuse into one warrior, who we'll refer to as the Namekian Savior, kind of like the one we saw in the Moro arc. From Yardrat, Beerus also recruits the Elder there. And if we're being honest, I don't want to butcher pronouncing his name. Pabara, Pabara, or whatever. This guy on the screen right now. But that means they have seven people on the team. And this is where some GT characters will come into play. Beerus has to get creative with who he recruits, so why don't we get creative? And bring in some characters that don't really exist here. Beerus is able to recruit General Rildo, Lud, and alongside these two, he finds one of the most promising warriors of all in space. Although the Tuffles went extinct long ago, they left one thing behind a powerful advancement in technology, a creation that may help them in a tournament of power, referred to as Baby. Since Piccolo and Nail never fused here, the person on Universe 7's team isn't the Namekian savior, it's actually just Nail, with all the other Namekians fused into him. So instead of a nameless Namekian hero, we have Nail who actually gets to do something for once. Cool. And also, a lot of you did mention Broly in the last part's comments. And it is a good idea to bring him up, because I feel like it's a little bit unlikely for him to come here. Broly is on a seemingly dead planet with little to no activity, and most likely he'd go under Beerus and Whis's radar. The other fighters on the team are much more prevalent, and much more unique. Beerus would be aware of the Frieza Force, the Galactic Patrol, Namek, and the Machine Mutants because they're all easy to find and in big groups. And frankly, I feel like bringing in Broly feels a little too easy and predictable for Universe 7. I've done it before, other people have done it before, so I wanted to do something a bit more unique this time. Bringing in characters from GT spices it up a bit. And, if the Machine Mutants were to exist in this universe, they'd be much more likely to pop up than Broly is. This wasn't a mistake, this was intentional, but it's worth mentioning because a lot of people were asking. Whew, okay. Two small retcons and a side note. Now with that all done, we could actually get into the meat of this part. So with so many Saiyans in Universe 6, the most obvious thing to do is a ritual. As I've said before in many other videos, a Super Saiyan God bargain sale. This time in Universe 6 though, Gohan, Kaba, Kale, and Cauliflower would get Super Saiyan God. As for Goku, Vegeta, and Gohan, they're much, much weaker than normal. But as for the team overall, it's broken, with a lot of other members being stronger than their canon counterparts. And as for all the Saiyans, the funny thing is, Super Saiyan God is their only transformation right now, at least that they know of. They don't even have Super Saiyan. Because as I mentioned last time, Vegeta already assumed he was a Super Saiyan, just like he did on Namek. Same with Goku and Gohan. In terms of power scaling for the team, let's go like this. The strongest member would be Piccolo, with all the Universe 6 Namekians within him. Behind him is Hit, and then followed by that is Vegeta. Close behind Vegeta is Goku and then Gohan. Another tier below that we have Kale, and then below that we have Kaba and Caulifla who are on the same level. And finally, we have Ten Shinhan, then followed by Krillin. Or at least, you may assume they're this low. I know a lot of you are thinking, Krillin, Ten Shinhan? What are they gonna do? But, with the ability to use Ultimate, as I've mentioned before, they're very strong. Like, really strong. And before the tournament, they even decide to train a bit in the Room of Spirit and Time. This will help further their ultimate form, and solidify their spots as powerful members on the team. And after this training, because how potent ultimate is, I wouldn't be surprised if this puts them on par with some of the other strong Saiyans. Possibly letting them go past Kale, Kalifla, and Kava. With all the training they've done in the past, and now with this training on top of it, you could tell they've seen some great gains. The tournament begins. Right away, many of the fighters are eliminated from Universe 10, Universe 9, and Universe 4, with a few small exceptions. Vegeta is obviously keen to pick up on Universe 7's team. It's actually pretty funny. Beerus recruited the Frieza Force? Vegeta actually laughs at this. And since he's biased, he wants to attack them first. King Cold chuckles as he commands the Frieza Force members to attack Vegeta. And with one hit, Vegeta eliminates Shisami and Tagama, leaving only King Cold left. He brushes it off, those two are weaklings anyways. King Cold is the main course. He wants to savor this moment anyways. He really wants to defeat Vegeta. Prepared to have fun, King Cold lunges at him. And with his training, his attacks are actually able to keep up with Vegeta's base form. It gets him a little too confident, because little does Cold know, Vegeta can actually transform. And it's not some power suppression like his son has. It's vastly different. Vegeta has had his fun, so mid-battle, he turns into Super Saiyan God. King Cold is surprised at first, but then makes fun of it. What, his hair is red? What's he gonna do with that? Well, Vegeta volunteers to show him, and with a massive final flash, he knocks King Cold out. He hopes King Cold enjoyed the taste of his full power. But there's one other person that enjoys this. Another person with a grudge against Vegeta and the Saiyans as a whole. Without Vegeta noticing, he's suddenly ambushed by Baby, someone who he didn't even pay attention to before. With Vegeta now at his full power, this was the perfect time to strike. And Baby is successful. He takes over Vegeta, as Beerus laughs in the stands. 
He expected some great things from this life form, and tells Baby now to knock Vegeta out and jump out of his body. But Baby Vegeta, he doesn't care. He's gonna keep this body and continue fighting. All these other Saiyans, they're his targets. You know it's a good thing Broly wasn't on their team. That wouldn't have paired well with Baby. Everyone is of course wary of Baby Vegeta now, and Piccolo warns everyone not to go full power. He's been observing Baby this entire time, and Baby had plenty of opportunities to strike at Vegeta, but he only attacked once Vegeta fully powered up, so Piccolo assumes that this left him open, for some reason or another. So now, they'll have to try to knock Baby Vegeta out without using their full power, definitely a hard task. Luckily for literally everyone there, Jiren never went full power, because otherwise we'd have Baby Jiren and everyone would basically be dead. Jokes aside though, they have this target at hand now. Krillin decides he's ready to sacrifice himself. If he lands a killing blow on Vegeta, that'll end up killing Baby, while Vegeta would just regenerate. Well, theoretically. He charges a massive destructo disc, launching it at Baby Vegeta. It cuts him in half, but he just regenerates. Baby can do that too. Damn, they can't just injure Baby, they'll have to fully kill him. As many of the other fighters avoid Baby, Baby ends up attacking Krillin, deciding he's the next target. But Krillin quickly lowers his power. He's in a tough spot though. Without any help, and without his full power, he's no chance against Baby. And he's about to be knocked out, but he's saved by Ten Shinhan. Keeping his distance, Ten Shinhan joins in to help Krillin, as the two try and face Baby Vegeta. The two decide to use one of Ten Shinhan's most powerful moves, one that Krillin has picked up in his time of training. Together, they both charge up powerful Kikohos. Baby assumes they're charging up to fight, and he notices that they're now at full power. What idiots! Now, he can take control of them. Leaving a bit of himself in Vegeta's body, he then jumps out, ready to take control of one of them, but just as he does, the two launch their Kikohos. And now with Baby exposed, he's incinerated by the blasts, as well as Vegeta behind him. Luckily, Vegeta does regenerate. He is immortal after all, but Baby is dead. Thankfully, this means they save Vegeta, but now Krillin and Ten Shinhan are eliminated, and Vegeta thanks the two. Good thing Baby wasn't fighting too seriously, otherwise they may have not stood a chance. Piccolo ends up facing off against Nail, saddened to have to do this. They both have similar stories, every Namekian from their respective universes are merged within them. Piccolo is pretty sad to hear about his planet, with Nail feeling the same about Universe 6, with Nail quickly coming to learn that Piccolo was originally from Universe 7. But he tells Piccolo not to worry. They have a pretty interesting member on their team, a yard rat named Paibara. He tells Piccolo, Paibara offered to defuse all the Namekians after the battle, meaning Universe 7's Namek will be okay. Piccolo is amazed not knowing this was even possible, and this actually gives him an idea, with Nail getting a similar one as well. It's clear that in this battle, Piccolo is the stronger one, and the two decide to create an alliance. So Piccolo asks Nail, they should team up, he wants Nail to fuse into him, all of Universe 6's Namekians and Universe 7's combined. Nail sees where he's coming from, they could always get unfused later, and this way they both have a better shot at surviving. He agrees, and during the tournament, he fuses into Piccolo. An unlikely alliance between Universe 6 and 7 is created. Jocko of course is on their side, as is Paibara. As for the other fighters, not so much. The good thing is, Sagambo is not too hard to defeat, but Lude and General Rildo are a bit of a problem. The Saiyans are ready to face off against them, but then Piccolo comes in, easily knocking these two out, but leaving Jocko and Paibara in. Zeno is actually pretty excited to see this, an alliance between universes. It makes him pretty happy. Maybe the mortals aren't too far gone after all, they may actually give him the wish that he wants. But there's still one big issue, and that's Jiren. Hit has already ended up trying to face Jiren, using his time abilities to try and knock him out. But, much like normal, Hit inevitably got defeated. Piccolo tries facing Jiren next, and it's actually a pretty good match for him, until Jiren begins powering up further. Piccolo is joined by the rest of Universe 7 and the two fighters from Universe 6, but even with all their combined might, it's still not enough. They're getting a bit concerned, Jiren's actually going to win, isn't he? But they have an ace up their sleeve. Before the tournament, Shampa decided to give two fighters the Patara earrings. With these, two fighters could temporarily fuse. However, it's not Kale and Kalifa who got them this time. He gave them to two stronger Saiyans instead, Goku and Vegeta. The two decide it's finally time to pull out the earrings. In mid-battle, they back up temporarily. They hope this works, as the two place earrings on and then fuse. Jiren is preoccupied by his fight with everyone else, but then sees that Goku and Vegeta are now gone. He then receives a powerful gut punch, as a fighter speeds past him. He actually wasn't expecting this, who was that? Jiren turns, and he sees who it was. Take a good long look. This is the true power of Vegito. Standing behind him is a brand new fighter, one who dubs himself Vegito. The rest of the team is elated to see this, as Vegito then begins powering up. Naturally, he goes into Super Saiyan God, but with a twist. 
He needs all the power he can get, so he summons part of Kakarot's side. Combined with the red aura of Super Saiyan God, another blazing red aura appears, as the fusion yells out Kaioken. With the help of Piccolo and the other Universe 6 fighters behind them, Vegito is able to help turn the tides a bit. Jiren begins powering up more, and still does retain somewhat of an advantage. But with Piccolo and Vegito there, with God Kaioken, it's not like it's a cakewalk for him, especially with all the other fighters from Universe 6 supporting them, and the two from Universe 7. I'm sure Jocko's really turning the tides here. They're all able to fight a few minutes, and they wear Jiren out a good amount. He's actually losing stamina, they're not able to knock him out, but they're slowly chipping away at his abilities. They just need one final push, but surprisingly, Vegito ends up defusing. Wait, what? This was supposed to last an hour! That should have been more than enough time. Too bad for Vegito, because he was operating at full power 100% of the time he was fighting. Not only was he in God, but he had Kaioken on top of that, and it's not like he was regulating how much energy he was using either. This caused him to defuse early, but still, the damage against Jiren is done. It's good, they just need to find a way to run out the clock, but how are they supposed to work around Jiren himself? The remaining fighters are Piccolo, Gohan, Goku, Vegeta, Kale, Kalifa, and Kaba, with Paibara and Jocko helping, and they all try their best to stay in the ring while fighting Jiren. It's only a few more minutes, they could do this, but it becomes increasingly clear they might not be able to. Suddenly, Vegeta remembers he does have one more option, but he's not sure it'll work and he needs a big opening for it, like a really big opening, just in case it doesn't work. He begins taunting Jiren, trying to get Jiren to fight him alone. The rest of the team is confused, what's he trying to do? But they can tell Vegeta has some sort of plan, so they let him continue. Jiren faces Vegeta alone, as Vegeta draws him closer to the edge of the ring. Once they're far enough away from the group, now it's his shot. He jumps onto Jiren, hugging him. Um, what? Jiren doesn't know how to react to this. Is, um, is Vegeta attracted to him or something? But he quickly realizes it's not that, as Vegeta then gets coated in energy, charging himself up. As he once did before, he self-destructs with Jiren in his arms, completely disappearing as every bit of him disintegrates. Of course, Jiren's able to survive this, as does Vegeta, but the one thing not to survive is the ring below them. Within a certain radius around Vegeta, pretty much everything was decimated. There's not even any stray rocks that Jiren can jump off of. A massive portion of the ring, almost half of it is missing now, as Vegeta regenerates around Jiren and the two fall into the void. The only contestants left are from Universe 6 and 7, Jocko and Paibara thank everyone, and the remaining gods wonder why they're not scared. Well, they know what Universe 6 wants to wish for, so the two of them jump out. This was a very impressive showing to Zeno. Sure, a lot of fighters were acting selfish, but this small alliance between Universe 6 and 7 gave him hope. Yeah, of course these fighters were from Universe 7 beforehand, but the only person they actually knew was Jocko. They teamed up with these complete strangers, trusting them, wanting to save both the universes and everyone else. And of course, the wish that Zeno expected is made. So in terms of MVP here, it would probably be Piccolo or Goku. Goku because of Vegito, and Piccolo because he's able to put up a good fight against Jiren. But pretty much everyone in the ring had the same idea. No matter who won, they wanted to restore every single universe. And the wish is made. All the universes are restored. And Zeno was more than content. After Paibara defused all the Namekians, including all the Universe 6 ones, they all head home. And it's a little bit cramped because there's so many Namekians there now. You know, it's kind of weird. They're actually growing pretty used to Universe 6. I mean, all their friends and family are here, and they've made new acquaintances on Sadala and other planets. And Shampa is pretty pleased, so he's not being a bad god of destruction. They won the tournament and thoroughly impressed Zeno. And Universe 6's mortal level got raised, so he's happy. All the fighters say farewell to each other, with Goku and Vegeta promising to visit Sadala once again, and Piccolo thanking the Namekians for their help. Hit also congratulates everyone and departs. And now, with peace restored, the scenario has concluded. So what did you guys think about this part? And while I'm not continuing this, do you guys think everyone would remain in Universe 6, or would they eventually return to Universe 7? Leave all your thoughts and suggestions in the comments below. I'll be sure to check them out to see what you guys think. As always, if you like the video, be sure to drop a like, and let's try to hit that like goal from the beginning of the video. If you haven't already, why not subscribe, as well as hitting the bell icon to get notified about any future uploads on my channel. Thank you all for watching, thanks for supporting this scenario until the end, and I'll see you all in my next video.